Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, for those that may continue to join in, um, if you want to catch the whole entire uh, recording of this, we will have this on our website. Um, today, uh, we're going to invite Mike Pearson to join us. Uh, a lot of great information on the markets that are, are kind of jumping around here lately. So um, Mike uh, previously hosted Market to Market on public television. Uh, also, he's got the Ag News Daily Podcast and currently the anchor of uh, This Week in Agribusiness on uh, RFD TV. Uh, Mike, we're honored to have you with us today and we're excited to hear what you've got, uh, got to say to us. So hand it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Luke. It's a pleasure to get back up talking to my friends in South Dakota. And I, I'm glad I get a chance to talk to you when things are so boring out there in the world of egg commodities. Oof, it has been a crazy 48 hours. It has been an even crazier 18 months in agriculture. Now, I know I've, I've had the chance to talk with folks in South Dakota a lot. Some of you may have heard my presentations in the past. And ordinarily, what I like to do is take a look at the markets. What are the futures prices telling us? And then we look at the fundamental factors that could impact those prices as we get through the growing season. This presentation is a little bit different. In 2021, what I think we're recognizing in the trade is that not only do we not have a really clear picture of what's coming down the pipe, we have much less of a clear picture than we'd imagined of what has happened over the past two or three years. We as an industry have been trading a set of numbers, uh, notably looking at crop production estimates from the USDA, that as we've worked our way into this fall, as we've come through harvest season, we've learned that, oh man, maybe there were mistakes. Maybe they were off. Maybe they were overestimated. And the market is desperately trying to grapple with this information as we continue to see strong foreign demand looking out ahead. So for today's presentation, I've flipped it. I think in order to have a real clear picture of what to expect going forward, we first have to develop a clearer picture of what happened over the last, in my case, in this case for this presentation, 14 months. We have seen an incredible change in the fundamental factors that drive a lot of agriculture commodity pricing. And we got to get our heads wrapped around those changes before we can start looking to the future. So for today's presentation, I have a ton of charts and graphics and information. I have an hour to get all of this information to you. And I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions because this is a strange and fluid situation that we're in. And I know a lot of folks on the production side are wondering how best do we make decisions to move forward? So that's what I wanna help out with. And that's what we are going to start talking about. So to kick things off, whew, let's take a deep breath and let's reflect a little bit on 2020. Looking down the line, here are some of the big changes that really impacted our business. First and foremost, COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic, has had massive impacts on everything, and agriculture is no exception. Secondly, incredible Chinese demand that has really kind of caught a lot of folks in the trade by surprise. The third thing, this disappearing 2020 corn crop. When we look at USDA estimates coming from the August uh, WASDE report all the way through today's WASDE report, we continue to see the, sh the size, the overall size of the 2020 crop shrink. In addition, we continue to see uh, ending stock shrink as more and more of our crop gets shipped overseas. An incredible combination of factors that really is working to the benefit for a lot of corn producers and bean producers who haven't sold out of their old crop stocks, which I think is a challenge for a lot of folks that I've talked to. We got great prices early on in harvest. A lot of folks took advantage of those, and now we're left watching this market move. How do we react? How do we adapt? How can we bring some of this revenue being created in, in the Chicago Board of Trade back to our operations, back to South Dakota, and back to encourage our fiscal solvency as we prepare to, to meet with our lenders, perhaps get ready for that renewal season that is getting underway, as well as what are we going to do for our crop mix in 2021. All those things continue to matter. Finally, the ethanol, not finally, but next, the ethanol demand decline. 
that was precipitous in 2020. As soon as coronavirus happened, the charts on the ethanol demand picture are mind boggling. And we'll get to those in just a little bit. Next, we had a national consumer focus on the meat industry. When we think about meat, uh, whether it's beef, pork, poultry processing, ordinarily in this country, those acts happen in the background. They happen out of sight, out of mind for the American consumer. In 2020, due to COVID, all that stuff was brought front and center. That creates opportunities and it creates challenges, but most importantly, it builds awareness for the industry overall when we look out across the countryside, something we've got to keep our heads or hands around. Next, we saw a major change in eating habits. America in 2018 was a dining out nation. In 2018, the reason I use that year as an example, in 2018, for the first time in American history, American consumers spent more money at restaurants than they did at grocery stores. The restaurant food service end of, of agriculture touching the consumer was booming pre-COVID. Things have changed. That industry is not getting back to normal anytime soon, and that's going to have long-term ramifications for agriculture. And we had massive stimulus. We saw stimulus from the state with regard to, uh, in some cases, ramped up unemployment benefits. And we had fiscal stimulus, or federal stimulus rather, in the terms of the, uh, the $600 checks earlier in the year, the most recent one, and the potential for more stimulus money coming out of Washington, DC, as we roll into this spring. And there was one other thing in 2020. I don't know if, if any of you guys noticed, but we also had a presidential election in 2020. It, it, not a lot of us uh, really paid that much attention to it, but we did see some changes in D.C., and we're going to continue to see changes in Washington, D.C. All of these factors hit our industry over the last 12 to 13 months. Folks, it has been a whipsaw of a year. How do we manage this thing going forward? Well, let's dig into what happened with a lot of these factors throughout this past year. To begin with, let's see where coronavirus sits today. A lot of us are really fired up. I, I know friends and family are out there. They're getting the vaccine in some places. I work a lot with Max Armstrong, and he recently got his vaccine. I think it was last week. He had to wait in line for three hours to get his first shot. He's scheduled for his second. It's starting to roll out, but it's slow. It's a tough slog. Right on the screen now, we are looking at uh, data from Johns Hopkins University, and the map is looking specifically at active cases. We're not through this quite yet, folks. We continue to see COVID be very, very impactful in the United States, in all of Europe, and it's growing, continues to grow, I should say, in South America. This matters for a number of reasons. One, it is part of what keeps restaurant demand so volatile. Two, it's part of what is keeping ethanol demand down. And third, coronavirus has changed export markets around the world. We have seen a number of countries put restrictions on fellow trading partners who have had uh, coronavirus picked up on uh, packaging in bulk transport loads. And we've seen cargoes get blockaded. We've seen cargoes be returned. We've seen meat imports into China banned from some countries because there was the coronavirus fear. These things are going to persist throughout 2021. Speaking of coronavirus, folks, I do apologize. I've developed a cough and I just got my COVID test and it hasn't come back yet. So I've got my finger on the mute button. <clears throat> I may have a cough throughout the, the conversation. It's a good thing we're virtual today. COVID isn't going anywhere for some time. Uh, the verdict is still out on whether these vaccines are going to really crush it and we'll see this thing fade into our memory holes and we'll, we'll move forward as an industry. Or I'm inclined to believe that uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, will be a recurring headline. Um, a lot of the folks I've talked to are under the impression that uh, coronavirus as we go forward is going to be similar to the flu in that we'll come up with vaccines and then it will mutate and there will be variants. And so for the next several years, it's very likely that we will have COVID hotspots, perhaps domestically, certainly globally, that will keep this thing in the headlines it's going to impact our business long-term. Everybody touched by COVID is a consumer of an ag product in one way or another, and coronavirus changes the way they approach our industry as consumers, and we have to be aware of that. We have to be cognizant of that 
as we go forward. Specifically, here was one of the major impacts we saw from coronavirus as this thing was getting started, and this is dining in. Oh man, I miss dining in at restaurants. It's one of my favorite things in the world because I am lazy and hate to cook. Here we can take a look at the specific events of what happened. This data is from Statista, statista.com. It's a fantastic resource of interesting data collections. And here we're looking at seated dining in restaurants, looking from February of last year, so pre-COVID, or at least pre-lockdowns from COVID, through just about the first week of February. And as you can see, when that thing hit March of last year, dining capacity, seated dining capacity, went to zero. We had a 100% decline that persisted for six weeks as those major lockdowns took effect. Then, of course, various states started lifting them. They started modifying them. I believe on Monday, Iowa, my home state, has now lifted all restrictions. Illinois, on the other hand, still has quite a few lockdowns. South Dakota, you guys have kind of been the exception to the rule for a long time with regard to uh, the way COVID has been handled from a, a restaurant and get-together perspective. For the rest of the country, it is still very much a factor. And we are seeing an impact pricing, particularly of higher-end proteins. The restaurant market has been an incredible place for American producers and meat processors to add value to our products. There are very few places that we can charge $60 for an 18 ounce ribeye. You kinda gotta be at a steakhouse to get that done. And nobody really wants to spend that on a steak that's going to ride in their car, travel all the way back to the house, maybe get nuked in the microwave before it's time to eat. So that high-end premium market has kind of disappeared for the bulk of 2020. Alan Merrill. And it is a very slow the return meeting. coming back in 2021. As you can see, we're still at 50% uh, total decline in seated dining. When we add back in carryout and delivery, we pick back up a lot of that percentage, but we're still down between 15 and 25% on total dollars spent at restaurants. This means that consumers have a lot more disposable income to spend on dining at home, but they're not as willing to spend as much premium on high-end experiences, which is really what agriculture has captured with our high-value proteins. So this is something that is going to impact us long-term. Ethanol. Another major factor that took a beating in 2020, I've got two charts here on this page, and I apologize, my PowerPoint skills are roughly the same as your average seventh grader. So if we look in the upper right corner of this chart, we can see fuel ethanol production capacity by region. All of us, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Illinois, Indiana, we're in region two. We are the top ethanol producing region in the country. Makes perfect sense. We're the Corn Belt. If we look at that chart, we can see that in 2020, we had record nameplate productive capacity for ethanol in the country. Great news. This had a lot of folks in the industry, myself included, really excited as we were moving into 2020. We had folks getting out. They were driving more. We were maybe pushing our way through that ethanol blend wall that has been of a, a lot of concern in the industry over the past several years. And then boom, COVID, coronavirus hit, and we saw driving miles completely drop off. So that's the next chart. Over there on the bottom left side of the slide, we can see actual monthly production of ethanol versus nameplate capacity. And look at that V, that drop in production right there, March, April, and May of last year, the bottom fell out. This, of course, has an impact on drivers. It, of course, has an impact on corn demand. And there are a lot of smaller follow-on effects that producers have noticed over this past year. One of the most important is the lack of DDGs, uh, distillers, dry distillers grains for use in cattle rations. Those have become a crucial part of cattle production across most of the Midwest, all the way through the Southern Plains, to be honest. And they disappeared. Didn't matter if you had them contracted, if the plant is shut down, you ain't getting no DDGs. And that was a struggle that a lot of producers faced this last year. Well, it's going to be a struggle going forward. 2020 and 2021 could be the first time in about 15 years that we see actual production capability of ethanol decline. There have been several smaller producers so far. I haven't heard of any major ones exiting the industry. But uh, smaller producers who have produced ethanol and, by extension, distiller's grains on the side, they've closed up shop 
or they've refocused their energy away from ethanol, and that's going to have a lasting impact on domestic corn demand. Now, as we sit here looking out ahead to 2021, we are seeing some encouraging statistics. We're seeing driver miles increase. Some companies are returning people back to the offices. That means the return of a commute for a lot of, uh, a lot of American consumers and a lot of American employees. And as they start commuting, they're going to start burning more fuel. Now, longer term, we also have some changes facing the ethanol industry when we look at the potential competition coming down the line from electric vehicles. Uh, we have seen uh, some, some trial balloons floated. General Motors, of course, any of you who watched the Super Bowl saw they are really promoting their new electric vehicles and they're gonna go all electric by 2035. Well, these are things we as an ag industry, particularly in the Corn Belt that rely on ethanol, need to keep an eye on. I think it's still very, very early in that transitory period uh, towards electric vehicles. I think a lot of things can still change and a lot of things will be shaped by federal policy and the way those wind their way through the system. So I don't want to write off ethanol quite yet. I don't think this is dead. We, we do produce a fantastic lower carbon fuel that we can mix with high carbon gasoline and make a great mix for the American uh, uh, fuel consumer until we get to electric vehicles. But that's going to take a reframing of how we discuss ethanol. Now, over the past two weeks, there have been some overtures by our friends in the petroleum industry uh, that are now looking out at potential, potentially the elimination of liquid fuels in 25, 30 years, perhaps. And they're freaking out. This is an industry that has fought ethanol every step of the way. And it's really tempting, I think, for producers, for myself, who has dealt a lot with uh, with different petroleum manufacturers. Being an Iowan, I've been raised to support ethanol and it's really easy to tell them to go take a hike. You know, you fuel, you oil producers, you've fought us for years and years and years. But at the end of the day, we're on the same ship. Uh, I, I think looking forward, we have a better product in ethanol in terms of improving combustion, reducing tailpipe emissions, uh, really working to bridge that gap until we can transition away from fossil fuels, which is where the, the popular consensus is moving. I think it'll take a long time to get there, but that's the drive. Ethanol can serve as a bridge, but to do that, we might have to pick up some strange bedfellows. And it might be ethanol producers lying in bed with oil refineries in order to maintain this industry for the next 25 years. Reassessing is going to be a key component in 2021. Looking else down the line, talking about meat on the front lines, getting folks fired up about the meat industry. This is what happened. And a lot of us know this here in the heartland. When all of this was going on, when coronavirus first struck, I was living in downtown Chicago and I saw the meat shortages. On April 1st, the grocery store across the street from my place didn't have meat. Uh, there were a few, you know, turkey burgers left. There was a lot of the, uh, the alternate uh, meat, like fake meat products, whatever you want to call them. Uh, all of those things were, there were still some, but broad-based meat, it just wasn't an option. You couldn't purchase it. And that's true in a lot of cities around the country. In agriculture, we get spoiled. I think in some ways when it comes to food availability, because if our grocery stores run out of meat, right? For most of you folks watching right now, you've got neighbors in cattle production. You've got friends who maybe uh, work at a locker or have connections with a locker. We can typically secure our own meat. When you're in downtown Chicago and the grocery stores are out of meat, it's terrifying. And it's something that uh, most consumers have never confronted in their life. And it focused all of this uncertainty that they felt onto one segment of the ag industry, which is meat processing. And it's a segment that I know a lot of farm groups have been raising concerns about for some time, as we've seen continued consolidation in that sector. All of that was highlighted in 2020. This is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it allows us to build consumer sentiment. It allows us to tell a fresh story. All of a sudden, we've got folks from the New York Times calling locker plants in rural Iowa, local lockers, to get their thoughts on meat availability. When was the last time a local locker was interviewed in a national publication? I don't think it had ever happened before in my life. And here it was happening in 2020. 
this opens up some opportunities for producers that are willing to, to take the time and the effort necessary to go direct to consumer. I'm not saying it's going to be a fit for everybody, but 2020 opened that door wider than it has ever been opened before in modern agricultural memory. We might see in 2021 more local lockers opening than closing for the first time in probably 30 years. This could be great news. We will be diversifying the mix of livestock processors, and I think it's going to happen at the margins. At the end of the day, we do have a ton of consolidation in the meat processing world. We do have uh, folks who may or may not have their finger on the scales when it comes to, uh, to pricing and reporting and, and some other advantages that small-time producers don't have access to. But if on the margins we can use the unrest created in 2020 to find new avenues for getting our high quality beef to consumers who demand it, that's good news for agriculture. And it creates additional opportunities on the major processing side. If we start springing up some competition, which I know is happening across the country, it's happening in Texas, it's happening in South Dakota, it's happening in Iowa, we're seeing this resurgence, this upswelling of producers and consumers using the digital tools we have available to us now to find new buyers. That is really exciting. We made it through 2020. A lot of folks, particularly in the cattle and hog industries, took a bath, a big bath, an ugly bath. A lot of my friends that I've spoken with this past year have had to shed acreage. Uh, they've had to call in favors to cover some of their debts. They've had to do what they needed to do to survive. But a lot of them have survived. And now we're planning for the future. And it could be exciting. So I want all of us, as we look ahead, to be positive. This is tough when we come through such a year. Now, for a lot of our green growing friends who are watching right now, it may not be as tough when we look at some of the market movements that have happened recently. But particularly, friends, on the meat production side, we're moving in the right direction. We're moving towards an era of more consumer choice, and the more consumer choice there is, the more opportunities for consumers to spend their dollars in a way that aligns with their values, the more premium producers selling to those consumers can charge if they're producing to meet those values. This is a great opportunity, and I don't think we should squander it in the meat industry. And the good news is we're not. I've seen a lot of folks get very active this past year and they're fighting to change things. And that I think is the key theme of 2020. Unrest, upheaval, massive change creates opportunity for those who can grab it. And agriculture has been aggressive so far in grabbing it. And I want to encourage us to keep that going. So the good news is we have moved back. We brought meat production, large scale packer based meat production, roughly back online to where we were a year ago. It's a really good news. That's helped keeping us current. I know we still have some large cattle out there, particularly in the Northern Great Plains, uh, particularly in, in Northwest Iowa, Southeast South Dakota. We do still have large cattle because that's what we do in, in those parts of the world. We feed large cattle, but we're collectively a lot more current. The industry looks solid heading into 2021, though with lots of uncertainty still ahead of us. Jumping down, I want to talk about something that I think doesn't get enough spread in the world of agriculture. And this is the fiscal impact of what happened with 2020. Uh, those of us who make a habit of watching the news have heard catastrophic stories from uh, people who have been hurt in 2020. Uh, my business, 2020 was the my worst professional uh, year in, in my professional career. Uh, it was devastating. My little sister is a waitress out in Scottsdale, Arizona. She didn't work for six months, probably. A lot of folks were devastated, but a lot of other people are working from home. A lot of additional people have continued earning their same, same paychecks, but now they have nothing to spend it on. So I want to take a look at this personal consumer expenditures chart. So this is tracking what and how consumers spend their money. Take a look at that massive drop. Look at that massive climb. Obviously, as we've been coming out of the 2008 recession, the economy was going, going, going. Heading into 2020, I was so excited about where this economy was going to go and what this was going to do for agriculture. And then it ended. We saw folks put their money in their pocketbooks. They sat on them and they didn't open them for about a month and a half. 
even today, we continue to see reduced consumption expenditures. And this is due, I, I think, in a large part to the fact that, that folks have been not working for so long. And we just have less money to spend overall. But the folks that have been working from home have been able to maintain their lifestyles while at the same time cutting back their expenditures has led to this. This chart, I really can't stress the importance of this. This is total checkable deposits. This is what we call hot money. This is money in checking and savings accounts at banks and credit unions around the country. Look at that climb. We have a trillion dollars more of hot money in this economy. Now, right now, as we are preparing to roll into 2021, most of that money is just sitting in checking and savings accounts. The million dollar question is when and how does this trillion plus dollars of hot money come back into the economy? And what does it matter when it does? Well, let's take a look at some of the things that have recently happened. I'm sure a lot of us have heard recent news about GameStop, the GameStop, GameStop stock short squeeze. Boy, that's a lot of assets. Um, basically, we have a ton of retail investors who are the kind of people sitting on this kind of money, and they wanted to stick it to the big guys, effectively. And so they squeezed GameStop, and we saw the share price explode. Now, Google GameStop, if you haven't been following this, it's, it's a crazy story. Uh, David and Goliath, so to speak. But it's an indication of what can happen when folks who are sitting on tons of cash roll it into the economy. Inflation could become an issue in 2021. Now, I say that with tremendous hesitation, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of folks were preaching, it's the inflation end of the world in 2008. And then in 2012, oh, inflation's coming and gold spiked to record highs. Now, as we head into 2020, all of those people have been proven wrong over the past 14 years, 12 years. Uh, we haven't had inflation become an issue. I am inclined to believe that perhaps we're putting the pieces together to see an inflationary spike in 2021 or 2022 as COVID goes into the rearview mirror. We start to see some of these assets roll out, these cash assets roll out into other assets. So far, I think it's primarily been confined to the equity markets, stocks and bonds, and real estate. Uh, I have a lot of sisters, not the waitress sister, but another sister of mine. She and her husband uh, just about a week ago, or a month ago rather, decided to move to Austin, Texas. And so they've been looking at homes. And what they found was that homes in Austin, Texas were staying on the market for about six hours. And at least in, uh, in the places they were looking, it was expected if you buy a home in Austin, you make an offer on a place, you do it and you waive the appraisal. That means that your bank's gonna require an appraisal as, as a lot of you folks know to, uh, to get a loan. And if the appraisal comes in lower, you can't use that as an excuse to not buy the house. You've gotta come up with the other cash to make that house purchase work. And that's how these things are selling. We haven't seen that kind of excitement in the real estate market since 2007. I think it's really early to, to say this is indicative of a permanent trend, or at least a longer term trend. But I think it's certainly something we need to keep an eye on. Uh, we're seeing this uh, real estate issue manifest itself, not just in Austin, Texas, it's happening uh, around the country, less so in major metro areas, uh, more so in secondary cities. Des Moines is seeing it. I bet Sioux Falls is seeing it. Uh, this is going to be a, a sign that that money is rolling out of second savings and checking accounts and into the broader economy. Folks, the people who really benefit when inflation starts to take hold are folks with physical assets, folks with real estate, folks with physical grains, uh, folks with physical metals. And we're really well poised to capitalize on an inflationary spike if it should start to develop. And like I say, I think it's way too early to say that by the end of 2021, we'll be looking at three, four, five percent inflation. But I don't think it's too early to say that's a, a risk slash opportunity that could present itself to us as we roll a little further into this year. 
Next factor that has been driving ag prices is China's rebuilding of their hog herd. Here, we're looking back to, two, to excuse me, 2018. Their hog herd was decimated by African swine fever. In October of 2019, they quit publishing data about uh, their hog herd. And uh, since then, there's been a few other reports that have shown they're coming back. I think the demand drive from China in terms of soybean and corn demand tells us that they do believe they're rebuilding their hog herd. There have been in the past two weeks some headlines that uh, African swine fever is rearing its ugly head again in China and that PEDV, a disease that American pork producers dealt with in 2013 and 2014, is for the first time making its appearance in China. If we should see massive uh, depopulations happen again in Chinese hog herds, the risk that China could cancel substantial imports is there. Will it happen? It's way too early to tell. Could it happen? Yeah, that's the risk that lies ahead of us in 2021. China needs to keep rebuilding its protein production, not just hogs, they've also made a, a massive move into poultry. Uh, and they need to keep doing that in order to continue to, uh, to finalize their purchases that they've made from the United States. We need to keep an eye on this. China is going to be driving our headlines and our markets for the next several years. They are the gorilla in the room. and We don't know what they have on hand. A lot of us are hesitant to trust data uh, coming from the Chinese government. And I, I think history is, has backed up that, that hesitancy is prudent, but we can watch their purchases and we can watch for their cancellations. And those are going to be two factors that will be shaping market movements going forward. So far, we've really only seen the advantages of that trade deal, which is China making lots of purchases. If their hog herd starts to decline, cancellations could be coming, and we could see some more whipsaw action to the downside in the grain markets. Look at else, just, just a deeper dive into what's going on with the Chinese hog industry. Here, here we've got data showing that we are seeing them import a little bit less pork. Again, this is an indication that perhaps their hog herd is coming back. Perhaps they are able to manage African swine fever in a way that allows them to rebuild their stockpiles. But again, most recently, China has been selling stockpiles of frozen pork, and they have been selling out like this, and they've been moving at the very, very high end of traders' expectations. That tells us there's still a ton of pent-up demand for protein in China. The other factor, the disappearing corn crop of 2020. It seems like every time we get a USDA report, we do see the, uh, the corn crop, the supply overall continue to shrink. Now this month was a little different. We didn't see a shrink in supply, but we did see an increase in demand. Here we're taking a look at corn price versus ending stocks. Obviously, as the ending stocks number comes down, that's the American stockpile of grain. As that shrinks, naturally, the price has to increase. You look at where we're sitting today, we have the lowest ending stocks that we've seen since 2014. We have a phenomenally bullish setup right now in the corn markets. I'm going to jump ahead. Very, very similar, perhaps even more extreme on the soybean side. This is something that is going to matter. The question is, how long? That's the wild card. Right now, the theme in agriculture is that we are seeing phenomenal pent-up demand meet a much smaller supply than was initially estimated. But supplies can change quickly, right? We've got a Brazilian crop that will be coming out here very shortly. In fact, has started to roll out. I was talking to a friend of mine who runs an ethanol plant down there in Mato Grosso. He said this is the week that we're really starting to see an uptick in Brazilian soybean harvest in his area that's gonna spread across the country. And there's always upsets that can happen. The Brazilian truckers and Argentinian truckers will probably go on strike. That'll be a bullish factor. We'll probably have export delays. That'll be a bullish factor. But I do think we are going to see more grain coming out of Brazil as those trucks make their way to the ports. And the market's going to be holding its breath. Will we be able to maintain these price levels? Will the Brazilian crop be larger than anticipated? It's still very tough to say. But we do know that when more supplies come online, more buying opportunities are out there for our import partners, notably China in this case, and they will go to the most cost-effective place. Now, I'm excited that we're talking today because here just uh, two and a half hours ago, we had the USDA release 
this month's World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. Um, I did not have a chance to pull those numbers into Excel, so I'm just going to pull up the WASD report. So this is the report that the marketing services turn to very quickly when they come out. They're typically dropped at 11 o'clock on uh, the second week of the month, happened to be today. And I know not a lot of us get to read these things in person. We kind of rely on our friends in the, the ag media to break it down to us. So if you've never seen one before, this is what the WASD report looks like. We've got a little summation at the start of, uh, of the report. So we're looking at wheat, no big changes today in the wheat market. Uh, wheat is largely unchanged. We do continue to see very strong demand for white and hard red spring wheat. That's all going to China, largely because uh, the Chinese and the Australians currently aren't talking. And uh, Australia typically supplies Chinese wheat. They're not. China has put a moratorium on purchasing most ag goods out of Australia. So they're forced to come to the Pacific Northwest and that's supporting that market. However, that is being offset on the wheat side by the slower than anticipated movement in HRW and Durham. So that's kind of the update on the wheat market. Looking down globally, the headline here, if we take a look at the second paragraph, week out wheat outlook is for greater supplies, increased consumption, higher exports, and importantly for pricing, reduced stocks. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are seeing this wheat market follow right in line with corn and soybeans in the overall trend. Next up, let's jump down and take a look at what the USDA says for corn. Here we've got this month's corn outlook, jumping down here, first paragraph under coarse grains. We are seeing exports raised 50 million bushels largely in line with trade expectations. We would have liked to have seen them increase more based on the pace of Chinese purchases over the past two weeks. I think a lot of us were thinking we might see 60 to 75 million bushels uh, moved up in the export category. USDA, I think, is looking down the line and they're saying China has agreed to purchase a lot of this stuff, but they haven't yet taken delivery. And I, I think the USDA is being very cautious in managing these expectations. And they're trying to make sure that, that we don't spook this market too much higher by saying it's gonna be a, an increase of 100 million. Now this does open the door in March and in April and in May for USDA to continue increasing that export number if China follows through on their purchases. So that's going to be something we are going to have to continue to pay attention to. Importantly, we do see the season average corn price, uh, the producers, season average corn price go up by 10 cents. We're talking 430 a bushel. Folks, it wasn't that long ago, USDA was at 355. We have come up tremendously in prices over the past several months. Now I wanna jump down. I don't think we've got a lot of rice producers up in South Dakota. So let's take a look at soybeans here, get the, the newest numbers. Um, the soybean outlook, again, we're looking at increased exports. We are seeing phenomenal Chinese demand and those exports are continuing to shrink our carry out. If China completes its purchases, and, and I should say all of our other export partners, Mexico is another huge buyer of US corn. I don't mean to give them short shrift. They are certainly helping improve our prices. Similar story in soybeans, China is a bigger gorilla in the room when it comes to demand there. If they follow through, we could very well exhaust pipeline supplies as this Brazilian crop is coming online. Folks, volatility is going to be the name of the game as we get through these next several weeks. We are going to see these competing factors, tightness of the US soybean supply and questions about the Brazilian soybean supply. And these two factors are going to be butting heads and driving pricing for the next several weeks. Anybody who tells you they know exactly where soybean and corn prices are going right now is insane because we are on the precipice of things changing and they could change massively one way or the other. For producers right now, the risk really, to my mind, is to the downside unless things stay dry as we start getting into the planting season. Right now, South Dakota, Western Iowa, really Des Moines and westward you folks are dry. Subsoil moistures are depleted, and it's a much drier situation today than it was in January of 2012. Now, a lot can change weatherwise. I'm not a meteorologist, but the idea that we could see a very dry year, which means tighter supplies coming out of the U.S., is real. Things could get really interesting as we head into this summer. I want to have folks 
manage risk, but also be ready to maintain some profitability and to keep a little powder dry to capitalize if a drought should develop. Uh, next, I want to zoom back over to the PowerPoint. Bear with me as I pick it up here. And I want to jump down to some of the changes that are happening in Washington, D.C. Obviously, we are looking at... Um, oh, my slideshow is not working. We are looking at what is going on in D.C. Of course, we do have a new Secretary of Agriculture, kind of. We've got a new old Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, President Biden nominated uh, uh, Tom Vilsack to the role, and his nomination was approved. And I think this was a prudent move on behalf of uh, President Biden. I think a lot of folks in farm country uh, felt raw, perhaps, is a word to use from the election. And this certainly appears to be a, uh, a, a peaceful effort. I, I think this is the Biden administration reaching out to folks and saying, hey, look, you had Tom Vilsack before. We had incredible profitability uh, during his years as the, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture. Let's go back to that time period, a kind of a return to normalcy, which has been really a, a, a strong point that the Biden administration has tried to make repeatedly. Vilsack, I think, is, in, is emblematic of that. And I think that his uh, nomination and his leadership will help sort of heal things a little bit in Washington, D.C. We additionally have seen new members added to the Senate Ag Committee. I've updated them here on the PowerPoint, and I have sent this to both Luke and Carla. So if any of you would like a copy of this PowerPoint, by all means, just drop them a note and feel free to take it. Debbie Stabenow from Michigan uh, will be the chair. The ranking member from the minority is, uh, is John Bozeman. And we're seeing some fresh faces. We're seeing some fresh ideas come into agriculture, and we're going to see some pushback. The one that I have seen a lot of folks push back on most recently is a Senator Cory Booker. And, you know, folks are concerned about the fact that he's a vegan. Folks are concerned about uh, his stance on uh, livestock production, modern livestock production in the confined space. And I, I think we're not done fighting politically as an industry quite yet. But I do think we are seeing some bridges being built, and I, I think we just have to continue to push forward as an industry. Uh, there's a great opportunity here to make our voices heard, and we need to take advantage of it. And when you get new people, it's a new opportunity to educate. It's a new opportunity to reach out and explain what we're doing here in farm country. And I hope that agriculture as an industry can grab these new opportunities and really put our best face forward with a lot of these folks who are becoming um, in close contact with agriculture for perhaps the first time. And this matters because when we take a look at what's going on, we are going to see a lot of pushback on this issue right here. We had a tremendous amount of government payments during the final several years of the Trump administration. And uh, whatever your thoughts on those payments politically, I think they certainly made sense from the perspective of the trade war. However, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And politically, impressions and images matter. And the image of American farmers receiving lots of, of government funds while the markets are climbing, like we've seen since harvest, I think are going to create a tough row to hoe for those of us in agriculture in 2023 when it comes time to renegotiate the farm bill. I think if there are programs in the farm bill that you are deeply supportive of, now is the time to start reminding congressional delegation, both South Dakotas and other states, about the impact those programs have had on your life. Because I think the risk is there that we could see Washington pull back some of the support that farmers have put together over the past several years. Some of it, perhaps the MFP, the CFAP, it's good for them to go away now that we've got prices rallying. But when we look at crop insurance, when we look at some of the, so the safety nets that have been built for agriculture, I, I think we're going to see folks in Congress looking at them more closely in 2023 than they have in a, in a long time. And that's a risk that we need to be aware of.
Now I want to jump down and I want to talk markets and folks, we're not going to spend a lot of time specifically on the markets because things are so volatile right now. And I want to leave plenty of time for questions so we can discuss markets in the questions if you've got some. Taking a look at old crop corn, here's where the excitement is. Old crop corn and old crop soybeans, this is where the markets are fired up. This is where we are seeing that immediacy of tight supply meet phenomenal demand. We're looking at a six month chart here of corn. The purple line is the 50 day moving average. That blue line is the 200 day moving average. Folks, look at that move to the upside. Now that the market has taken out that 550 headwind that had really kind of blocked us in moving forward in old crop corn, we're feeling a little more confident. Myself, when I look at these markets, the move appears to be to the upside. The trend is our friend until it isn't. And the one thing that could make the trend not be our friend anymore is a massive Brazilian corn crop going in the ground. So I do think if you've got a lot of corn, old crop still waiting to find a market, let's get some of that unloaded here before we get too far into planting season. I'm looking at May as a time when we'll be able to suss out what is happening down in Brazil. We'll have a pretty good idea of what to expect with weather over the summer. And I think at that point, we'll be able to really pull the trigger. But that's the risk time that, let's call it April 15th to June 15th, is where we are going to see substantial downside risk develop in this corn market, particularly in old crop. And it'll spill over into new crop, which we're talking about next, if the Brazilian crop is massive. As of right now, we continue to see this thing move up. We continue to try and test those highs there in the market from, uh, from back here a few months ago in the new crop corn contract. And I think on the new crop side, we are going to have to wait a little bit more to really push through those resistance levels. You know, we're going to have to wait and see what happens down in Brazil, or more importantly, perhaps, what happens with ethanol in this country as COVID starts to go by the wayside. I'm not super pumped about getting everything sold right now uh, of our new crop expectations, but I do think if you are modifying your acreage plan to take advantage of some of these prices, let's take those modified acres, and whether it's additional acres going into corn or soybeans, and let's hedge it. If you're using today's prices to make management decisions, capitalize on today's prices and stick that money in your pocket. Leave some, some dry powder. Again, if it gets dry, just like every year, things could go absolutely insane. But as of right now, it's too early to call that risk, but it's not too early to reduce a little risk if you are planning to make changes to your rotation. Taking a look at the soybean market here, we've got a very similar scenario. We are looking at, let me jump back here, I apologize. Let's look at old crop soybeans. There's that strength. There's that phenomenal demand coming out of China. We do need a little more excitement, I think, to push us up and over those contract highs that we set uh, a little while ago, but we're close. And the fact is, right now, we're watching Brazil. If you still are sitting on old crop soybean supplies that you want to reduce the risk exposure on, let's take advantage of these prices. If the Brazilian crop starts coming out, the downside risk could be potential. We could be looking back down in the range of $11 fairly quickly if the Brazilian crop materializes. And I'm sorry to keep leaving so many weaselly outs like if and or in my words, but that's the risk right now. That's the world we live in. There is a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Now on the new crop side, very similar scenario. Again, we're, we haven't yet taken out those contract highs, but the trend is still moving up. We're continuing to risk, or excuse me, weight this risk as growing. Demand is phenomenal. China's hog herd needs to keep going and the American economy needs to come out of this COVID slump. But if those things happen, we could very well take out those highs and then if things get dry this summer, folks, particularly in August, as you all know, for soybeans, we could go to the moon, not to the moon necessarily, but a $15, $16 new crop could be in the cards if, if it gets very dry. If it doesn't, I think we're kind of here. I'd be watching at $13 and I'd be, be getting some sales on the books for my new crop, especially if I have put additional acres into beans. Um, let's talk wheat just real quick. Here we don't see as clean a trend as we see in both corn and soybeans. We can see a lot more volatility. We see a lot more movement. And as a lot of you folks know who have raised wheat, that's just the wheat market. The, the wild card now is in wheat, will it continue to track corn and soybeans and continue to move its way up 
we are feeding prodigious amounts of wheat, not just in this country, but in China and in Russia as well. And we don't yet have a good handle on exactly how many bushels are being chewed up. We do know that we have ample global supplies. The wheat market is probably going to bounce around here in these ranges. Again, dryness could make it go to the moon. I always got to throw that in there. It's a CYA move if, if a drought does come into effect. I want to take a quick look at the live cattle markets. Folks, look at that trend. I know a lot of my friends in the cattle industry have been really frustrated. They've been caught off guard by this massive move higher in feed costs, and they're wondering, man, when are we going to catch a break? I think the cattle industry has a lot of excitement ahead of it. It is the market that I'm perhaps most bullish on from today's price through the end of summer. If the vaccines are successful, if Americans are able to get out there and get them and then start going back out to restaurants, this is where we are going to see that demand pull through into the market first. We are going to see incredible demand for beef as folks get back out to restaurants and get back out to grilling. So I think there could be a lot of room to the upside. If COVID comes back, if these new variants break out, if we see shutdowns of processing plants, we could very easily run this thing back down to the $90 mark. So there's risk on the table. If this is the time of year you like to put hedges on, look at these opportunities that we've got in front of us. We're looking at six month highs right now in April live cattle. I know the price isn't super sexy, but it's better than we've had. And if it is your practice to hedge right now, Let's get some of this risk off the table, maybe explore some re-ownership strategies with a broker, but let's capitalize on this move while we can. Similar story in feeder cattle. Here, of course, we're dealing with the higher feed costs as being rolled into the crush, and we're seeing a lot more stability here in the markets. And finally, I want to touch just real quick on what's going on with lean hogs. Look at this move to the upside. Again, these from that really big candle till today, that was when the news is broken about PEDV in China. And again, this resurgence of African swine fever. This is moving to the upside. This is creating tremendous pent up demand for hogs. And the expectation is that we'll be the supplier to fulfill Chinese protein demand. And that's really creating some opportunities for pork producers, particularly the independent guys who can capitalize on this market move. Before we take a break for questions, one of the key factors that I haven't discussed a lot, but I think we need to keep in mind is this dollar index. Look at that drop as we got through the tail end of this last year. We have been printing a ton of money in this country, and it looks like that is probably going to persist at some point. We'll get some additional stimulus out of Washington, D.C., and all those things serve to weigh on the value of the dollar. That's a really good thing for agriculture, particularly in the moment where we are, where our high prices are sustained by exports. Since this dollar has started to collapse, the dollar and the real from Brazil have been trading roughly in concert with one another. That means that we're competitive price-wise with Brazil, which is something we haven't seen for the past four years, and that's really giving us a leg up. Now, I do want to take time for questions. We've got a little bit of time left, and I just want folks to remember that as we look ahead, guys and gals, the sun is going to rise over agriculture again. We have phenomenal support for our industry, both locally domestically and internationally. And we've got shakeups and we're gonna have changes as we look out to the future. But we are also going to see some good times ahead. And we've kind of gotten a little taste of them over the past six months. And I'm excited to be in this industry going forward. I think we've got a lot of things to look forward to. And with that, we've got about nine minutes left, six minutes left. I wanna be sure we could get some questions in. Luke, do we have any questions from the audience quite yet? Not in the chat box here yet, but feel free, everyone, type your questions right in the chat box, and I'll be sure to get those uh, asked to Mike. Um, Mike, I do have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, last week, Secretary Vilsack had mentioned that he would be open to the idea of revisiting cool. Do you have any insight on that? And, uh, you know, the, when he was Secretary of Ag, um, you know, in years past with the Obama administration, there was some there were some trials to try to get that pushed through WTO. There was issues with Canada, Mexico. What, what's your hot take on, on this? Great question, Luke. I was hoping it wouldn't come up. <laughs> so I, I do think that one of the, the things that changed last year was with the focus on the meat industry is for folks that support MCOOL, and I know that's a farmer's union position, um, the iron is hot right now. I, I think this is the time we've got a new administration and we've got an administration that's willing to shake things up and to fight for the little guy. And when you look at the arguments on behalf of MCOOL, 
boy, that's that's the preach, right? Is this is a way to level the playing field for American producers. I think we are going to have a, a, a an, an Ag Senate committee and a USDA that is willing to perhaps look more closely at the issue than we've had in a while. MCOOL is a strange topic in that it is somewhat bipartisan. It's bipartisan both in supporters. Uh, I remember just a few years ago, we had Tommy Lauren out there uh, really promoting it on behalf of the, the Made in America. Let's, uh, you know, not, you know, all, all the various reasons that, that she had for promoting it and had the ear of President Trump. Well, now that the, the Democrats have assumed power in Washington, D.C., I think we're going to see continued push from the left side of the aisle as we look at the, the trade impacts, you know, the things that could happen. Now, I will say that as we make those pushes and there is bipartisan support for MCOOL, there is also very bipartisan opposition. Uh, you folks know this also well. There's phenomenal Packer opposition and Packers are active politically and their checkbooks are bigger than yours and mine when it comes to some things. And I do think that they're not just uh, of the right or of the left. And so it, this could be a great year to have those discussions, raise those issues, make it apparent and tie it to the consumer. I think that's the moral here. If we can show that MCOOL would perhaps allow for a more consistent, a more stable supply of US beef, that's an argument that's really going to find ears in Washington, DC after the disruptions of 2020. So continue to do the research, continue to advocate, uh, and either side. Uh, this is the time to, to really be loud and to, to get your point across. I think you will find more reception in Washington than you've had in recent years. And this could be the time to, uh, to see some things get shaken up. Thank you, Mike. Uh, another quick question. You had mentioned it earlier in your markets here. I'm kind of changing topics now, but um, you were talking about the new crop for uh, corn and soybeans. And you had mentioned taking a look at um, what was it Brazil to, to look to see how their planting goes, I guess. Um, yes. Can you, can you kind of cover that again? When should folks maybe be looking to make a move if they're putting a marketing plan together to see that margin kind of narrow a little bit more? Great question. So the time to make a move, and I'm going to jump to my soybean chart here on the screen. So we're going to be looking at, uh, at November soybeans here, because this is the one that if we're going to make a marketing move for new crop, we should probably look to do it sooner rather than later. With corn, they're getting that second corn crop in the ground beginning here in some parts of Brazil, maybe right now, but really picking up speed as we get a little further into March. And that harvest, of course, will come mid to late summer. Now, looking at soybeans, those are coming out of the ground right now. And the challenge I think a lot of folks in the markets and in agriculture face is we don't have a really good handle on what's gonna come out of Brazil, but more importantly, when it's going to come out of Brazil. Um, I would be really encouraged, again, if you need these prices for your marketing plan to work, let's get some hedges on right now in soybeans. The risk that perhaps for the first time in history, nothing goes wrong in the Brazilian harvest could be present this year. If those Brazilian crops are able to get out of the field, get on trucks, get the two-day trip to the, the ports done and shift, we are going to see weight on new crop soybean prices as the world fulfills, you know, refills its stockpiles. It's going to be a similar, so soybeans, I want to be really aggressive in the next six weeks if I need these prices. If I can gamble a little bit more, and maybe it's a percentage of my production, maybe it's some, some uh, acres that I, I've got laying around that, that I think we could produce, I think you can hold some and you can gamble or you can look to, to maybe re-own, buy some calls here in the, the soybean market. Things could get fired up later on in the year. The challenge that we're facing right now is the same challenge growers face this fall. Prices accelerated, they got really attractive and we sold. We did what we were supposed to do. We sold into these rising markets and then they continued to rise and a lot of folks are frustrated. 
a very similar scenario could play out this spring. I want to maximize my, my management of risk availabilities earlier in the year with these price levels. I want to get a profitable base of sales done. And then I want to wait and see. And I want to explore if dryness comes, prices could really move higher. We are not in uncharted territory necessarily, but look at this up, upswing on the graph. Prices have been moving and if dryness persists or if the Chinese hog herd continues to grow, these things will continue to move. On corn, when we're looking at getting some marketing plan in place, again, I like that May to about the 4th of July to really get locked in on some new crop sales because that's going to allow some weather scare into the market. That's going to allow some dryness news to permeate the story. And we're going to have a pretty good feel on what China has actually taken delivery of, Luke. Mike, thank you. Hey, really quick, I know we're running short on time, but we do have a question in the chat box here. Any prediction on organic prices? Organic pricing is going to stay very strong. I, I don't have a to the penny prediction. My world pretty much exists in the tradable futures contracts. And of course, there's uh, very, very little of that for organics. But I do think the consumer cash stockpile is going to allow them to make greater food choices. And I think organics are one of those places where we are going to see consumers willing to spend a little bit more. It's been a growing segment. It's going to continue to be a growing segment. And I think if producers are weighing the opportunity cost to get in or get out of organics, to me, the opportunity costs to get in are uh, a little less. I think there's more opportunity in organics. If you're looking to make that shift, do the research, but I'm feeling pretty good about it as a sector of US agriculture. Mike, do you have time for one more question? I got all the time in the world. Luke, lay it on me. Excellent. Um, Chat box question, uh, carbon credits and carbon uh, sequestration, uh, what should farmers and ranchers be doing, if anything, to capitalize on opportunities to mitigate potential issues? That's a fantastic question. And I am going to punt on this question. Uh, carbon credits and some of the discussions being had right now in Washington, DC, are we're going to see that market shift over the next uh, six months to a year. I think we're going to see additional guidance, additional guidelines, additional players in that market. I would be encouraged if I'm a producer who's already doing some of these tactics uh, that can help capture carbon, carbon credits, do some digging, dig into individual companies. This is the, the place I'm at right now is researching as well. I, it's a segment that's going to grow. My gut says that this could be a tremendous value for American producers who are again willing to do the extra effort. And it's not just extra field work, it's extra paperwork as well, from my understanding. If you're a kind of a producer who is organized enough to handle those kind of issues, I think there could be some nice profit opportunities coming down the line. I would say if you're curious about carbon credits, uh, do drop me an email. It's a topic that I am actually at this moment learning about and working with some friends at different ag companies who have built their carbon markets. Um, and like I say, I don't have all the answers as of yet, but I'm learning. And if you'd like updates on that market, I'd be happy to drop you a note as I learn more. So Luke, great question. I apologize for not having a great answer as of yet but it's a market that's changing quickly and could afford some cool opportunities for growers and the environment. Well, Mike, thank you so much for all your time. And when can we catch you on uh, This Week in Agribusiness? You bet. You can find us on RFD TV every weekend, uh, kind, kind of early in the morning on RFD, or you can find us on 130 local stations around the country. Check your local listings or visit uh, farmprogress.com and you can watch us right on the internet. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being with us today. And we do have this recorded, so uh, it will be on our website. And uh, you do have the slides over to us. So for those uh, viewing today, if you would like copies of these slides from Mike, just uh, email us at sdfu at sdfu.org. So Mike, thank you so much. Stay warm. Hey, thank you all so much. I wish you the very best in 2021. Stay warm for now, stay safe at planting, and let's keep our attitudes high. Agriculture will continue to grow stronger as we go down these next several years. Thank you, Mike.